So mm -hmm. do you see a, mm -hmm. a recording button? Okay. All right. Um, I guess I can go first because I'm Good. a facilitator. Um, I guess I've been doing empathy circles for since December or something like that. And I've asked both a participant and I guess recently I've started to do some facilitation because the folks here recognize me. <laughs> they figure I know what I'm doing. So um, would you, and I'm also involved with the uh, XR, uh, I guess, technology group and some of the other, many of the other XR groups as well. Um, and I'm in Denver, Colorado, by the way. Right. And uh, would you like to go next, Marguerite? Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I'm Marguerite. I'm um, in um, Stroud in the UK. And um, I guess I really started getting more involved with XR in sort of January with the mass mobilization. Um, but sadly, this whole virus thing has put a real dampener on that. And um, yeah, but uh, it's good to be here. So I'll pass you to John. Hi, I'm John Bito. I'm in uh, Seattle, uh, Washington on the West Coast of the United States. Um, I uh, first started organizing with uh, Extinction Rebellion San Francisco uh, in January of uh, 2019 when uh, XRSF launched and uh, I've worked with a couple of uh, XR groups in uh, the US but I've been working with Seattle uh, for just about a year now. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. And I guess we should put, uh, might be useful to put the um, uh the principle i guess right in the uh in the chat so we have that what was it something like we challenge ourselves and the and our toxic system or something we openly challenge ourselves and the toxic system we open challenge ourselves and the toxic system so and i suppose I it, the subheading was leaving our comfort zones um to take action for change. To take action for change. Okay, so I've added that in the chat for our reference. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. So, um, since I'll be the facilitator, I will model first the active listener. And so, if one of you would like to volunteer to be the speaker, I will, uh, it would be my pleasure to listen to you and that I would just ask that you pause every now and then during your five minute share so that I have time and the, the memory to reflect back uh, uh, what you're saying piece by piece. And then, and then the speaker then will become, uh, or then I will, become the speaker and then I will pick another activist. Okay. Are there any questions about that, I guess, before we start? No, just. Does anybody I, want I, to be, oh, I'm sorry. No, I could go first or John, do you feel ready? I haven't really got a lot up here. <laughs> do, you, do you feel ready to speak, John? Uh, sure, I can, I can speak. Sure, okay, okay. thank you. Okay, and I, I guess I'll be the timer, okay? So whenever you're ready, John. Sure, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, once you, having left uh, my comfort zone, uh, you know, there's sort of this uh, constantly moving uh, uh, space of comfort, uh, maybe widening. I'm not sure what the right analogy is. Um, and, uh, but I mean, I encounter uh, the, the question, uh, you know, am I, um, you know, is, am I acting 
out of ego or hubris uh, or uh, and you know and uh, what can I do to f make safe space for others to uh, enter the, the space that's comfortable for me but it's outside their comfort zone mm. okay so um what i what i heard you say is that um you're speaking of your comfort zone and as you challenge yourself uh your comfort zone is getting bigger i guess or it's expanding slightly as you're challenging it and then that new zone becomes a new comfort zone i guess but you're asking yourself whether you're doing this out of hubris or ego and you're wondering if in the process of doing this whether you're narrowing maybe the space this is, i guess i'm using my own words you know narrowing the space or the opportunity for others to enter into the space this this comfortable space that you're creating in your challenging of yourself uh no that didn't occur to me that i would be narrowing but i mean it, it, you know i think the the um yeah the challenge and, you know, the thing that I'm unsure of is, is how I can uh, act in a way that uh, makes that space that's comfortable for me and an opening for folks uh, that, you know, are, uh, you know, aren't uh, trying to leave or lo looking into leaving uh, their comfort zone and uh you know move into you know where you know people who are less experienced and and feel more constrained um you know can can i act in a way that uh, uh encourages uh, them to leave their comfort zone okay so i this is kind of a summary. I, I, it, so you, I, I, I hear you. What I'm hearing is that you're asking yourself something to the effect of how, as, as my comfort zone is increasing, how can I help those that are not as comfortable in some of the spaces that I'm now comfortable in? How can I help them to find comfort in these? Um, edge spaces for them. That, again, that's my word, I guess. These, these, these uncomfortable spaces for them that are now comfortable for you, how can you help them navigate their way into, into the comfort that you found? Or something? Or, yeah, that, that, yeah. And then, uh, and so that's uh, some tension with, you know, me, you know, for myself, uh, moving out of my comfort zone and, and uh, acting in uh, uh, more challenging ways. Uh, it says, you know, I imagine in doing that, I'm, you know, my actions are, are become less accessible. Uh, to the folks who are, um, you know, just beginning to explore the, the edges of the, the comfort zones. Okay, I, I'm gonna, the, the timer went off, but I'm gonna reflect back what I, what I think you communicated, John. Um, so, what I heard you say is that as you're getting more comfortable, you're, um, you're concerned about, I guess maybe there's a fear, there's a concern and maybe it's a fear of some sort. Again, this is my word and I probably shouldn't be doing this, but it seems to be a concern 
that as you challenge your comfort zones and find greater comfort, you're afraid of leaving others behind. And that perhaps there, I, I wasn't quite sure, this is maybe a speculation on my part, but there's, it's almost like that becomes a new challenge for you. Uh, that what you've kind of laid out, like you had your original challenge. And then now as you think about other people and perhaps leaving them behind, this now becomes a new challenge. And then the question is, how do you overcome this fear of leaving others behind or something like that? And, and if I'm wrong, uh, or you would like to refine what I've said, please, please I, I would like you to continue. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I wouldn't say that, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's a, a tension that I feel in, you know, um, you know, moving into uh, more challenging activities, uh, you know, it, um, you know, if, if I'm doing that and, you know, you, you know leaving others behind, right? I mean, then uh, am I doing them, right? I mean, can I be of more service by helping them move into a space that I'm already comfortable in, I guess, is the, the tension. Mm -hmm. Okay, so okay, so what I'm hearing is that underneath this is a question, a new question you ask yourself, as you as your comfort zone gets bigger, how can you be of service to others, with right. regard to the matter of comfort and 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 discomfort? Right. Yeah. Okay. I, I yeah I feel uh, I feel like you, you yeah, I feel hurt with that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, so it's now my turn. I was the active listener, so it's my turn now to, to become the speaker. And um, Margarita, Margarita or Margarita? Marguerite. Marguerite. Yeah. Marguerite. Would you like to be the act, my active listener? Thank you. Okay. Um, I really didn't know exactly what I was going to say. Um, when we entered into this, and I'm I'm grateful for um, for John speaking first and providing um, a seed uh, for the for the for the exploration of this. So I'll pause there. Yeah, you were feeling a bit uh, nervous about starting off, and you appreciate John for starting starting us off and giving us a seed. Mm -hmm. Um. So let's see. Uh, yeah, I, I'm gonna. I would like to focus on the first part of it first. Um, that we openly challenge ourselves in the toxic system. I guess the. I'm very much in line with the whole idea that this that that we are the system. That 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 it is a social system, and that we must take responsibility for it, um, even if we are. Um, we, even if we have less power, decision-making power, we are still participants in the system and we must take responsibility. We can't play victim. Oh, so, can... so um, yes, you've, you're looking at the first part and you're saying that we are the system and that we have to take responsibility for that, even though we, we're not responsible for decisions but we, we, which, yeah. yeah, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I would say that. Because if we're, in order to change the system, um, we have to challenge ourselves, our own, we have to challenge the role that we've been playing, the things that we've accepted. And I'm, we as communities and we as individuals in that community, as members of those communities, we have to take responsibility that that we have to we have to take on leadership ourselves we have to we can't expect you know it's like please change the system mr master into a system that doesn't screw us screw us over and screw over the planet we have to 
take responsibility and define a new system ourselves. Well, I definitely heard that last bit. You were talking about we need to, to define the system that we're living in. We, we take responsibility. We can't always be saying, you know, change the system from saying this to people higher up. You've got to change the system. We've got to take responsibility for changing it. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like, it, it, I mean, it, some people say that um, much of this system, you know, if we look, if we call this like kind of an Anglospheric model, you know, th there's a, uh, uh, I think it's George Lakoff, which is who's a linguist. Linguist. He he talks about the the morality system in the U.S. as being a strict father morality, that of highly patriarchal system, and it we can't basically say, please, Daddy, we don't like the abuse that you're putting us through. Please change this. We have to we have to step up and you know push push mm -hmm. push the father away and say we're 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 doing this we're doing this in a, in a, a fairer and more just way. So yes, you're talking about the system, perhaps terming it as patriarchal, that it's a very male dominated father type of system and that we have to take responsibility for making it, for challenging that or maybe making it a different system or, um, Maybe you could follow on a bit more. Yeah, yeah, and I would almost say, you know, we could say paternalistic. I, I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily see it as, as, um, you know, male or you know, male or female so much. That that's probably a part of it, but it's more paternalistic. It's kind of like we're the too much of our. There's like a part of the advertising industry has has is set up to to culturally infantilize us to make us unthinking children to make us uncritical unthinking children where we're not reflecting on our on our on this, on ourselves and and society so yes you're feeling that it's a, a very paternalistic. Yeah, you got your. I didn't. I didn't do the timing. It. It may. We may be coming to that. So why don't we do this last share and. Yeah. Um, you sort of re-termed it paternalistic, that we're all sort of behave. We'll be told to behave like children, to take what we're told to do. Is that right? It's, yeah. 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 I. I feel. I feel her, Margaret. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, so it's me now, is it? Yes, and then would you, would you like to listen to me, John, please? Oh, yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, yes, for both of you, I suppose that idea, um, I've always been a bit reluctant to talk about being involved with um, Extinction Rebellion because there's a part of me that, that sort of wants to shock people. Um, and, and then there's a part of me that doesn't want to get that um, response that people will say, oh no, XR is all about disruption. No, I don't like it. I don't. So I'm always in a bit of a, um, a dilemma. Um, maybe I should let you go. I'll give you space to do that. Uh, so, uh, in your, uh, social circles, uh, you're some, uh, you haven't disclosed, uh, that you're involved in Extinction Rebellion, uh, because, uh, you anticipate that, uh, people would say they don't like it. Uh, yeah. But um, uh, yeah, okay, <laughs> I've lost the plot there. Um, but I do feel in a sense, even though I was sort of got a, a bit involved in the October rebellion, um, it's only since I've really got involved in this mass mobilization that I've got very involved and 
XR has become very important to me because it's, um, it's the best thing we've got at the moment. And, um, and it's so frightening where we are at, you know, so, um, and, um, but I, I do like your point when you talked about, um, yeah, that how, how do you bring people in who are not feeling comfortable? Because that, that is something. I'll let you give a space then. Uh, uh, so you were uh, talking about how uh, you became uh, more involved in the mass mobilization in January after an initial exposure in October uh, and uh, Extinction Rebellion uh, has been quite a, become quite important to you, uh, seeing that it's uh, the best chance uh, we've, we've got at the moment. Uh, and uh, you're uh, interested in the, the possibilities of um, uh, helping new people uh, become uh, interested in leaving their comfort zones? Because, um, yes, I, I just feel everybody should be involved. You know, there's a part of me that thinks, you know, everybody should be concerned about the climate, about the mess we're making. And yeah, and it just sometimes gets me so angry that people aren't. Um, I'll let you. Yeah. Uh I mean, yeah, so you, when you're looking at uh, uh, the information that's available, you see that that everybody should be involved and, and uh, you know, seeing people uh, you know, sort of step, stand back from action uh, can lead you to feel angry. Mm. But um, yes, I did hear, I was listening to Joanna Macy talking and um, she was talking about, um, well, it's the capitalist system that always makes us feel we're not good enough. But if we buy this product or buy this car or, you know, we'll be all right. They're always trying to sell us something that says we'll be okay. And, you know, that's, a part of the toxic system that, um, you know, one aspect, I suppose there's many aspects of the toxic system. Yeah. Uh, so in, uh, in our, uh, capitalist system, uh, or you know, capital capitalism is, I guess, uh, it sounds like uh, creating a, a, a chunk of this uh, the toxic mess. Uh, if, if, if we should, um, and uh, the uh, uh, yeah, I guess I, I got I got a little hooked on Joanna Macy when you said that. So. Um, I think uh, yeah I, th I think I may have lost uh, the gist of, of what you were saying I'm sorry well maybe in my maybe I'll be rounding up soon I would have thought no but anyway I, I think I'll look at the different aspects of the toxic system that we live in and definitely the capitalist system that's really always telling us we need these different things to be all right. right. You know, new, new cars, um, you know, the right clothes, um, the right house, the right holiday, you know, so everybody, and this is always making us consume. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Is that it? Yeah, it went, it went off. I had the I had my um, right. microphone muted, but John can reflect back. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. So uh, yeah, the, the capitalist system uh, keeps us supporting it uh, by uh, feeding us with inform uh, information uh, that uh, tells us that we we need to have things uh, to um, make ourselves uh, properly people mm. uh, with uh, the right car or the right uh, holiday or uh, the right clothes, then we'll, you know, if we have those things, then that, that's what's going to make us okay. Thank you. Thank you. I feel listened to. So. Okay, so it's your turn to to speak, John, and you just have to pick somebody. Now you can you can pick either one of us. You, you know, you can reverse the direction here. Yeah, I mean, I think we should probably, you know, you know, we, we don't have a lot of options, but we might as well, you know, go the other way. So I'll ask uh, Marguerite to uh, to give a listen, um, and uh, you know, I I think. Uh, uh, yeah, the. An element of the, the toxic system that uh, I've been uh, uh, thinking about uh, lately is uh, the, um, the uh, pri privilege that, uh, you know, many of us uh, who uh, might consider might be considered you know middle class um, you know uh, enjoy and uh, exert unknowingly so um, I think you're sort of looking at the toxic system and looking at privilege and definitely the middle class you know, has got advantages that, um, is that right? Yeah. Uh -huh. And, uh, yeah. And uh, I think, um, that's, uh, part of the, the, um, fortification of the uh, uh, top elite uh, they uh, you know the, the middle class uh, has a need to uh, defend uh, their privilege or the you know the aspiring middle class uh, those who aspire to you know, be middle class you know, need the, the privilege to exist and you know there's that's manipulated by uh, those who have great wealth uh, to protect their own privilege. So you, you went on to talk a bit more about, well, the elite, which is even further on than perhaps middle class, and they want to protect their interests. Is that right? Uh-huh. Yeah, but the, I mean, the, the middle class are, are actually in, in league with the elite, uh, because the middle class feel the need to protect their own privilege, and mm. the, the you know the you know the very wealthy, very powerful uh, are able to uh, use that as a defense of their own privilege. So you feel the elite are using the middle class to protect themselves because the middle class want to defend their privileges. Exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, and I'm I'm seeing you know one of the the problems in the uh, environmental mu movement uh, 
you know, over the years is that uh, it's been populated by middle class people who um, bring their privilege and, and exert their privilege in unconscious ways. So you feel in the environmental movement, which has been often largely middle class, um, and often when they come in, they, um, can't remember the word you used, but they abuse their position somehow. Is that right? Uh, yeah, unconsciously. Unconsciously, that was the word you used, yes. That position of power, do you think? Is that what you mean? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, it may not uh, be uh, overt power, but uh, just the, um, uh, you know, the, the uh, ability to, uh, to get things. I mean, it, you know, in, in the U.S., uh, we had a, a group that splintered from uh, XRUS and they uh, used their uh, privilege uh, to uh, convince uh, folks to give them access to the uh, email list. Um, so they, they, um, they exerted a, a, a privilege and you know, misused uh, resource. So we've, we've just been given the sign that the time's run out. But um, to just try and so, sum up that, that there was a splinter group in the US that, from, that splintered off from XR and used their privilege to get the contact details. Is that right? Yeah, the, yeah, the email list of people. The email list, yes. Mm -hmm. Pretty shocking. But, um, but I hope you feel listened to. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, so it looks like uh, uh, Richard just joined, uh, just joined us. Um, hi, hi, Richard. Hi, hello. Hi. Have you, um, have you participated in uh, an empathy circle before? Yes, several. Yeah. Several, okay, okay. Well, we're... I think we've gone around uh, what two or three times already. Uh, mm, twice, okay. twice already. Okay. So, um, if every if everybody's comfortable with uh, continuing uh, with Richard here, um, I guess it was uh, who goes next. I, I <laughs> Marguerite uh, speaks and chooses. Who to okay. 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 All right. Well, Richard, would you like, uh, can you, can you um, tell us who you are? There we go. We haven't really had an introduction from you. So. Yeah, sure. I'm Richard. I'm originally from the Netherlands, uh, living in uh, Germany now, a little bit south of Berlin in Leipzig. Mm -hmm. uh, my background is non-violent communication and also um, theater. So kind of I'm in, in the mixture between non-violent communication and theater. And I joined Edwin from the beginning with kind of empathy circles. I also have my daily empathy circle running in Germany, kind of a small circle in the Southeast of Germany. Um, that's me, roughly. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to listen to me? Yeah, so... Um, yeah, we've been talking a bit about different aspects of the toxic system, all of us. Um, and I do feel in a sense, yes, because it's not really classed as the capitalist system, isn't it? We openly challenge ourselves and the capitalist system. So it's the toxic system. It's not, but um, it's definitely, I feel people are um, set upon, up against each other rather than together. Everybody is competing all the time. Um, um, yes, yeah, so I'll let you reflect that bit. Well, I'm going yeah. to so what I hear from you is that you um, <clears throat> you have this um, thing like, you know, if it's the capitalist, cap capitalist system or the toxic system, 
kind of that you were weighing in on that. Um, and what I hear also that for you kind of toxic is also the aspect where people are put against each other or kind of are set up against each other. But I think John was talking about how uh, in a lot of environmental movements, it's, uh, it's often attracts a lot of middle class people and, and, and they unconsciously um, abuse their, their position of or their, ex their power. And I, I think that's true. And, um, and I, I'm not sure how to, um, to challenge that. That is a, a very, but it's, it's good to be aware of it. Um, because I was listening to one of the circles, um, the first um, principle, and there was um, somebody from um, an African West Indian background, and he felt, he was talking more from racism, but he did feel that um, sometimes his experience in exile was very, it, it aggravated him because of this unconscious, perhaps racism, and, and I suppose the same thing with, with um, that class system. I'll let you, there's a lot in there. Mm. Yeah. So what I heard is that you picked it up from John, that there was this um, thing that kind of a lot of environmental movements are, um, um, are with middle class, middle class people. That's also that you want to uh, reflect on and, and um, maybe challenge. And that you also had some um, um, some experience with somebody coming in from a different background, different racial background, who was also challenging, like, okay, um, the issue of racism in the mm. event that you were in. Because mm. yes, I suppose in a lot of ways, it, a lot of our. Um, I don't know what you'd quite perhaps what the word is, but a lot of our ways of relating to people is a bit unconscious, you know, so um, it's how to get, get under those. But I think it's, it's good to, to be aware. I think that's the first start. First word. Yeah. Yeah. The two keywords that I hear is uh, unconscious and aware. Um, that you have the impression that a lot of the things uh, come from an unconscious, so not intentional, but un unconscious. Um, and that the first step that you see is awareness, that there is this raising mm. awareness and nurturing awareness. Mm. But, um, and it's, it's a great opportunity to feel that... Um, yeah, the XR has this structure, which you um, like these principles and values, which mm. give a, a, a better way to to um, challenge things. Because I, I did some work for um, Greenpeace many years ago, and even though there was a, a real camaraderie, there wasn't these principles. So. Mm. So what I hear is that you see great value in the principles um, that are within XR and that it also um, allows people to challenge themselves and to challenge each other by having those principles a kind of as a guidelines or... There we go. Well, I think, um, thank you, I feel listened to. So... Yeah. And then, would you like to reflect me? Yes, yes, I would very much like to do that, Richard. So, I came a little late because somehow I mixed up the time, so I had the impression, oh, I'm exactly on time, and then probably you already were running for an hour, so, okay, challenge myself there. Um, yeah, so challenging um, ourselves and our toxic system. Mm -hmm. um, I sense, I sense at the moment one of my biggest challenges is to not see people as toxic and not um, to clearly um, 
difference between systems and people, so to say. Um, that's a challenge that I have. It's also coming from my non-violent background. Um, yeah, so that's, I see that as a, as a challenge. Okay, so what I heard is that you, you, were, you were sharing that you, uh, you, you perhaps didn't get the time right and you were commenting that, that you were late and, and you didn't want to be late, but uh, you misread the time. Um, and then um, that you were expressing a challenge that you're having between when you, when you think of the concept of toxicity, uh, is it the system that is toxic or are, um, or, or is it, or is it the people and somehow your experience, your nonviolent background is your background in nonviolence communication is somehow, um, in contradiction to perhaps some of your thoughts on where you're where you identify the the source of the, of the where you identify the source of the toxicity yeah and i also know that sometimes it's it's more easy to find people stupid or to find them dumb or mean <laughs> than it is to check in myself so to say so that's that's one of the challenges that i have it's saying um for me at the moment is most of the time what happens around corona and kind of lockdown and, and measurements of what kind of uh uh, things that are taking place here, including in Germany, kind of, we have now this duty to wear those masks in the in the stores and in the public transport, and also to yeah, kind of that's a challenge to express and to support also people around me to not put the blame on people, but to be say very clear, it's a system, it's not the people. Okay, so you you you're fight you you're you have you are aware you've become aware of this tendency in yourself that it's easier for you when you see something wrong to blame it on the stupidity or the meanness of individual people, but yet you as you further reflect on this that you are seeing. That it's that it's more the system. The system holds far more responsibility yeah. for this behavior than these individuals. And two things that help me, kind of. Um, one thing is this: uh, there is this poem from Tits Natan, kind of that is um, "Call Me by My True Names," where he basically says, "I am, I am everything." Also in this form, I am. So I am. Um, the, the worker in India who has to work for his minimum minimum thing, and I am uh, the boss who sends him to the. So I I noticed that's just kind of um, a challenge or a practice that I would like to see. Kind of can I fully say like I am also you know this this minister president of or this this prime minister of Germany who is um, asking people to wear masks, can I fully say like, yeah, I am also this person? Can I, can I kind of um, empathically and compassionately uh, connect with that person? Um, also to the point that I can say like, yeah, <laughs> I am Donald Trump, you know, which is kind of also a big challenge there. But I, I, I know it, kind of it gives me some, some challenge there to, to challenge myself. And, and saying like, yeah, the toxic in, in, in the system and it's it's not inherently in the people, so to say. So even a Donald Trump kind of, you know, there is there is a human there who is um, part of a system, so to say. Mm -hmm. Can you reflect that? Okay. That was the time. That was the time. But I will um, I'll reflect back uh, mm -hmm. what you said there. Um, so what I heard you um, call to mind was this this uh, practice or this contemplative practice from Thich Tan, uh, This is the Buddhist. Uh, yeah. Thich Nhat Hanh. Thich Nhat Hanh. Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, that uh, this practice of uh, kind of an empathic practice, I guess, some kind of I am. I am everything. I am the worker mm -hmm. being sent out into the fields. I am also the work. The boss that sent the worker out into the fields. 
um, I am the prime minister, I am the US president, I am mm -hmm. the impoverished person on the street, and that this practice um, you're finding very challenging, but you, and for example, I am Donald Trump, for example, but yet you see that it helps, even though it's very challenging, is that you're aware that it helps you to see that these people are human beings underneath this, you know, perhaps bad behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and that just to, to, to view this in a wider perspective, that it's part of a larger system of like a narrative, uh, like a cultural narrative that, that, that perhaps has more agency than these individuals or something. I threw that last bit in. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you for listening. Just for reference, I put the I quickly found the poem and I put it in the chat box. So if you okay. want to see it, read that thank later. Thank you very you much. Check. Thank you very much. Yeah, I um, feel here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. When I speak, I keep forgetting to set the timer. So this is uh, okay. Um, John, would you like to be my uh, listener? Yes, please. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. First of all, I'm, I'm probably in agreement with pretty much everything being spoken about here. Um, there's a, a German philosopher that has kind of expanded my thinking on a lot of this. And his name was, is, is I guess he's, he's no longer living, Hans uh, Jonas. I believe, and he wrote something called The Imperative of Responsibility. And he, he looks at the system in the sense that essentially technological innovation, and I guess I would expand that to, to ideology, you know, whether that's economic ideology, like capitalism, for example, that these have been set up that they do not value um, they don't value life intrinsically. And so they're not connected to the organic uh, realities of life. And so they end up, they're outside of the, they're outside of the awareness. They're not part of the system. And so essentially technology and ideology is set up that it's amoral and unethical because it does not include, it doesn't take the basic assumption that we are life and we are part of life. And that that is the essence of the, um, of the toxicity. So what I heard is that, uh, um, I, I can't remember the, the name of the uh, philosopher or the, the, uh, the work that you referenced, but uh, the, uh, thought is that uh, we've set up uh, a, a system uh, and, uh, and which is based on uh, amorality uh, because this the system uh, has a set of values that do not include life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I put his name in the chat box there, Hans Jonas. Um, uh, he was supposedly um, one of the thought leaders behind the German Green Party, I guess. Part of his work was, was uh, influential uh, with regard to the German Green Party. Um, yeah that 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 essentially i i basically see i basically see the corporate the corporation is an is the instantiation of the capitalist mindset of the capitalist system and that the bureaucracy of the corporation is a technology itself and that is that technology does not recognize the value of life it is only oriented to make profit for shareholders. And so when you don't think about, you don't include ecology 
and you don't include life as having a value, then you have an unethical system, unethical system that will just destroy any, because if you include life and you include the well-being of people, this decreases your profit margin. So by excluding nature and by excluding people, you, 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 in, you optimize for, um, for profit taking uh, for the wealthy. And because it's an amoral, unethical system, you can just, you can just treat people and the planet like, like a trash dump. And so that, 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 that disconnection, that separation, that basic lack of ethics and lack of morals is the essence of the toxicity. And so uh, uh, corporations are uh, the, uh, you said in, instantiation, or uh, I might say manifestation, of uh, a, a, a capitalist uh, ethos uh, that is uh, it abandons uh, life and nature, uh, valuing only the ability uh, to move wealth, and I'll I'll add power uh, to uh, those who uh, are uh, able to exert uh, control over the corporations. Yeah, yeah. And I would just, just I know my time is up, but I just uh, add one thing that, and essentially that it's a lack of, that, that they're, that they, it's a lack of responsibility. It's a philosophy, it's an irresponsible philosophy, essentially that's operating in the world. It's a lack of responsibility. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, is it my turn? Well, just, just if you could reflect back on that and then. And then oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the, the um, uh, corporate uh, and capitalist entities uh, operate uh, without responsibility uh, for, I, I mean, you said lack of responsibility. Yeah, yeah. I feel I feel fully heard, and so it's I pass it on to you, John. Well, thanks. Uh, I'll ask uh, Richard to reflect for me. If it's okay. Yes. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Well, I. I was uh, uh, triggered by Dan uh, to think about uh, uh, you know, corporations as the uh, immortal beasts uh, that uh, can be everywhere uh, at all times uh, that, that we've created. Uh, you know, they, I mean, I, I yeah, I would, really like to start working on uh, a mythology of uh, just destroying these uh, uh, beasts that are threatening uh, or not uh, not just threatening but are um, you know killing uh, life as we know it So what I hear is from uh, that you picked something from Dan up, and that you also um, see um, that some corporations act like beasts, and that you um, are open to find some methodology where you can uh, take on those beasts. Mm. No, I mean, it, you know, I, I'm thinking of. Uh, uh, like the hero's journey, the um, mm -hmm. you know sort of uh, power of myth, uh, and 
you know, you know what we have we've created. I mean, corporations, uh, you know, are immortal. Uh, they are capable of being everywhere at any time, uh, and uh, you know, I think that's a uh, and their uh, destructive capacity is is virtually unlimited. And I think that's uh, uh, an, a ripe uh, space for uh, creating a, uh, a new myth of uh, the purpose of humanity to overcome these uh, immortal beasts. Mm -hmm. So I hear you referenced um, the hero's journey <clears throat> and also um, the perspective that um, um, companies can, uh, can be those beasts that are immortal, um, can be everywhere. Um, and what I hear that um, the thing of <clears throat> being open to a new myth that you are maybe actively wants to participate in creating a new myth or a new narrative where human values are more core? Yeah. And, uh, you know, if, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, um, yeah, I'd like to, to find uh, some folks in, uh, in Extinction Rebellion who have an, uh, a penchant, a cap capacity for working on, on, uh, on stories. Uh, you know, I think uh, the demands and uh, principles uh, are an important foundation, but uh, I believe there's a, a need uh, in when, for people to be um, motivated to, to really sacrifice. Uh, there's a need for, uh, a, a, I'm gonna say a spiritual uh, belief What I hear is that you're <clears throat> that you're um, looking in XR to find people who are also into story creating, narrative uh, creating, and that you also see a link to a uh, more spiritual story, a more meaningful story than the story that's there now. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I feel heard. Thanks. Yeah. Margarita, would you like to reflect the... Uh... Thank you. Um, yeah, one thing that kind of that um, pops up in me, kind of, that kind of something that I'm also, in a way, kind of connecting also with the corona story, is that there is this thing with toxic that makes you sick. And um, if you're sick, you need to get better. Um, and that comes to, for me, to the question of... Um, immunity so how can how can a body or how can uh, an organism keeps itself healthy it's kind of through its immune system and if it gets attacked by things like uh, viruses or things that are toxic so to say it's interesting like does this organism have some capability to recognize what doesn't belong and basically neutralize or or push it out so, to say. so I find that an interesting thought when it comes to toxicity kind of okay toxicity and immunity self of immunity immune system so yes in relationship to toxicity and that's me bit of an echo there um, you sort of interested in this the, the virus the coronavirus um, that immunity you know how does um a body keep itself healthy does it and it 
is able to fend off the 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 virus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I also noticed myself kind of one thing that I kind of have with some group of friends. There is this, um, some of them um, are kind of, um, I would say, um, spread conspiracy theories, kind of theories that, um, and one thing that I noticed that I have a problem with um, is that there is this kind of worldview that there are some people who are inherently mean or inherently evil, so to say. Um, and I notice when it comes to my own immune system, kind of since I see myself as a human being who is kind of likes to, you know, kind of see humans in their value. I notice it's interesting. Like there are some thoughts that I just don't want to get into my brain because, you know, just as a coronavirus, they hit kind of and they start destroying everything from the inside. And I find it an interesting metaphor, like, okay, how can you, how can I shield myself off from thoughts that are kind of, um, in a way, kind of um, sneaking inside and, and, and destroying my worldview? Or, or, and also this question, like, is it me, kind of Richard, who has to do something? Or is this worldview strong enough to defend itself? That's kind of questions that I'm uh, playing with. Um, you talked about um, some of your friends when they're talking about maybe in relationship to the virus that um, there's conspiracy theories and you wonder whether if you don't feel uncomfortable about letting this sort of stuff in because it'll affect you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm also kind of, in a way, it also invites me to to check for myself, like, okay, is my basis or, or what I am, is that is that dependent on my worldview? And do I have to defend my worldview? Because otherwise, if my worldview is attacked, I use my worldview and I lose whatever who I am or so. Or is there some deeper level that is goes beyond worldviews? Um and that immunity somehow takes care, that takes place on that level. It sounds, sounds a little bit, also when I say it, I'm, no, okay, that's, that's what I, that's kind of this question like, okay, what is there to defend on, on this deeper level? Deeper level? Um, I, th I think that's, that's, that's also the question kind of on what's there to defend or what's there to, to, to keep healthy? Um, and is it that I want to preserve structures or is there something deeper under there that's kind of independent of the structure that we have now and that's something that, that might survive um, crashes and, and other things? So the level like uh, what wants to survive and, and how does it defend itself or how does it keep immune from things that try to so, decorate so itself? So you sort of talking about your your view world view being threatened by these ideas and whether you feel your world I I'm not quite sure if I understood so do connect me whether that um, your world view is deep enough to sub sustain you and not let in these things that will perhaps threaten or I'm not sure the last bit I think wasn't right but might need to explain it again <laughs> yeah to some degree i'm also not clear myself so I'm, I'm happy to just you know just put out my thoughts so to say and and hear a reflection so um also it is as it is time now i, I think kind of right. i would okay. i kind of i will um but it's also interesting what you said kind of the, there is in me there is also some unclarity there is still this exploration going on um also with the situation that happens now. Um, yeah, so thank you for reflecting me back also in my, maybe in my confusion that is also reflected back. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So um, Dan, would you like to listen, please? Yes, I would. I just, just I, 
I, I sometimes forget to time myself when I'm listening. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. Well, we've um, covered a lot of different areas, but um, but it's very interesting that um, Richard was talking about conspiracies, and um, I was on this Zoom, which was about um, visioning and um, intention, and um, the woman who was sort of presenting, if you like, was um, was more or less saying. People like, um, um, God, I've forgotten his name. The, or maybe you can tell me. Um, uh, God. Oh, he's been very much promoting the vaccine for this virus. And um, Gates, Bill Gates. Bill Gates and, um, yeah, there's this sort of, yeah, they were talking about the sort of, idea that there's a number of people in the world perhaps a group of people are trying to control things and bill gates i'm pretty sure she mentioned bill gates um yeah so i don't know quite what this means to the toxic system but i suppose she was sort of um suggesting that yes you know trying to control the whole world and um i have heard some pretty mean things about bill gates but i don't know if it, perhaps i'm going off the um off you know he was getting involved in gmos and um in india so um i'd like to do a bit more investigating on that but um yeah in some ways i don't know if it's it's very healthy to to get into that sort of feeling but i should give you a bit of moment because <laughs> It's a bit complex. Okay, so um, it was something something about what he said about uh, what Richard said about conspiracy that that kind of um, start triggered your your thought process here, and I'm um, and how can we determine what is real and what is not real? And this this had you thinking. Then then this had you questioning. How does this tangent? Is this a tangent? And does it relate to the notion of toxicity? And then you started to think about this woman who gave a. Um, uh, there was a woman in XR that gave a talk on visioning, and um, and she brought up the idea of conspiracy and then mentioned this, the idea, the notion of the vaccines, and that there's, that there's perhaps possibly some sort of conspiracy that folks like Bill Gates and others might be involved with to distort the information or to restrict access to such and such and such and such, and that, and, but now you want to investigate this because you're not sure what's, what's real and what's not real. Yeah, she, she, I don't, it was sort of through an XR uh, presentation of you, but she was more what she called herself as a shaman. And um, I suppose she was talking about like that there was a massive, um, and I, I do feel that, you know, a massive change in consciousness, you know, this whole global virus, but there are darker forces that don't want this change to happen. You know, like what XR has, you know, the, the vision XR has of, of a different system, you know, um, and yeah, I guess there, there are people maybe who knows that don't want this change. Yeah. I'll let that. Um, so this was not, this was a, a shaman, uh, who was, somebody within XR, the XR community was a shaman. And she was stating that, you know, there are some people that, that, that see this uh, crisis as something that could be a chirotic event that could lead us into another system, but that there are, there's the, there are the elites that have all the power and they certainly don't want it to move in that direction. And so they're, they're doing what, they're can, what they can to keep the status quo. Is, hmm. Yeah, so it certainly it certainly have intrigued me. I've only been on it twice, 
and um, and uh, I wrote it down a little bit more last time, but um, but um, so that's uh, yeah. Thank you for listening. Um, I feel heard quite. And yeah, that's your turn now. I, I guess it's my turn. Um, I would like to pick uh, Richard if he is if you Richard if you're willing to listen to me. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Um, wow, lots of ideas here. Okay, with regard to toxicity, I think what you were exploring um, with uh, Richard, what you were exploring with John, I think is, is one of the aspects of, of, to of it's a struggle with toxicity, um, I, I feel. Um, and, and this whole model of, of, I guess there was there was the tri there was the the metaphor of the cor of the corporation as the beast and the need to make a mythology that you know the hero's journey and we will defeat the beast and and then we'll save the planet and save the people sort of thing um, and then the metaphor that you brought up with that the coronavirus is uh, with regard to oh with regard to your own um, let's say cognitive processing, I guess, that, that, that how do you, we have, we have genes that come in that are bad for our system, virus, RNA, and we, can we reject those? But then we have memes, ideas that come into our head, perhaps conspiracy theories that could infect our thought process. And how do we know which ones are good memes that, that make us wiser? And how do we keep out the ones that keep us uh, foolish? So I'll stop there. I was just framing. Yeah. So what I hear is that you um, you remember those two stories or two two narrative. One was the narrative of the of the company beasts, and the other is the narrative of the of the viruses sneaking in. Um, and also this um, what I've what I hear is kind of this thing like in a way if we have new thoughts or new stories. How can we know that these stories are nurturing? Um, so how can you see from new thoughts or new stories? Are they nurturing or are they um, eating? Or right, right, right. And and I think I think part of it when you were talking about immunity, the term popped into my head, and I'll I'll type it in here. Um, <coughs> um, suffer suffer scene. This is, a, this is a Greek concept, um, which essentially, I guess you could say, is internalizing the sage. But it, it's, it takes a lot of work to do that. So the idea is if you build up the ability to internalize the sage within yourself, then the sage will know what to reject and what not to reject. But I would venture to say that most people don't, don't have that level of philosophical thinking to have a good internal uh, sage within themselves to know to distinguish bullshit from from reality so i'll, I'll stop there mm -hmm. um so i hear you mention this word sophros soprosine yeah um and also the word sage and the, the, i don't know the word sage so could you tell what what that means uh, like a wise man a wise man yeah yeah Ah, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I know I, I lost a little bit the thread because I, I didn't know the word, so kind of I was puzzling. Mm. Could you tell again? Yeah, yeah, I can, I can tell. So essentially, um, if a person can develop this capability of sophrosine mm -hmm. or internalize, so, you know, you have a teacher, you have, a, you have a, your parents, and they teach you things. And then you gradually internalize their thinking in yourself, and this makes you wiser, right? Mm -hmm. And so that when you go out into the world, when somebody says bullshit, like you were giving the example of the person, some kind of conspiracy theory, or that there are evil people in the world, and you say, I don't want that, because you're, you're, I'm, you know, you've, you've created a, 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 a more wise story around mm -hmm. 
how people behave in the world. So this whole idea of good and evil doesn't really fit in so well with your larger complex way of thinking of things. And so you reject that. So in some sense, you've developed this inner sage or this sophronetic capability. I'll stop there for a second. Yeah. So what I hear is that if this word um, sophrosin is there, there is kind of this inner sage that is kind of grown or developed, also based on what you learn from your culture, your parents, your teachers, and that this inner sage is kind of able to to somehow, I put it in my own words, to kind of to create some kind of shield where things can't come in anymore that are um, insane or insane in it somehow. But there's some interpretation there, but kind of. No, no, I appreciate it. I, had, I have a lot more to say, but my time is up. Um, okay. So, but I feel fully hurt. Thank you very much, Richard. Okay. Um, John, would you like to reflect me? Oh, yes, please. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I like, I'm, I'm just continuing with this, with this wisdom, kind of the, um, I find it also interesting to say, okay, if, if you have wisdom, and, so, and maybe something like nature wisdom or so, kind of, how can there be a wisdom that's kind of resonates with, how things truly are or how kind of human be human beings truly are that can help to keep a system healthy or keep me healthy and in a way if i have somehow a system that somehow doesn't truly see what i am or or who i am then it will kind of weaken me or kind of transform me. you know if if people see me as a production unit you know in the end, kind of, I will be a production unit and basically I will use my inherent human value because, you know, that's not nurtured or so. And if there is something, a theory that's built on inherent human value, then that nurtures my inherent human value and then something in that direction. So, uh, what I heard was a, a hope for uh, a wisdom uh, uh, that would uh, bring a, a focus on uh, human va value of hum humans and nature uh, that would um, perhaps uh, uh, I'm going to say uh, counteract the um, effect of the uh, this system in which we are all uh, production units and uh, uh, when we adopt uh, that role we, we lose our essential humanity and so we, we need uh, 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 another uh, way to um, a, a wiser way uh, to understand ourselves and our humanity. I also noticed that when you reflected back, it's also like, yeah, for me, it's about value kind of okay what is what's kind of the utmost core story like what is valuable you know and if you know we say very simplified if money is valuable and everything that creates money is valuable and if human beings are in are inherently valuable and beautiful um that creates a different environment and that for me that feels also very close to the core like in a way if I think about storytelling, if there is this storytelling that starts with this base and say like, okay, it starts all with this thing like human life and basically all life is, is inher inherently beautiful and valuable. What kind of stories come out of that? And those are the stories that are worth spreading because in the way, those are the stories that kind of spread the seeds everywhere. Human life is valuable. The same way as kind of, 
you know, if money is valuable, everything that's based on that, it spreads inherently the seed everywhere money is valuable. And it, it, I know it gives me some kind of concrete path in saying like, yeah, kind of on the core of everything. If I just start with the premise, human life is valuable, what kind of stories come out of that? And if I share those stories, I'm kind of spreading the seeds of beauty or so. Sounds poetic, isn't it? <laughs> okay, would you like to reflect that? Uh, uh, what I heard was a, uh, a hope for uh, that when uh, we center uh, on the value of life uh, rather than uh, money and uh, bring uh, 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 propagate stories that uh, illustrate the value of life uh, that uh, that could just dis displace the uh, um, dominant view of, of money is the uh, holder of value Yeah, thank you. I feel inspired and heard, heard. Okay. Uh, so uh, I guess I'll ask uh, Marguerite, uh, would you uh, re reflect uh, for me, please? Certainly, thank you. Thank you, Marguerite. Yeah, um, so I, uh, so when we um, we uh, ch challenging uh, the toxic system and challenging ourselves, uh, yeah, I guess I I'll I'll say that there's uh, there's not really a a, a need for. Uh, Cons conspiracy, uh, because uh, those with uh, great wealth have, uh, you know, uh, uh, common interests of uh, of preserving uh, the system that uh, maintains that wealth. Um, so. Uh, they don't ha really have a, a need uh, to coordinate or con conspire with uh, one another. Uh, they can act independently in their own interest and, uh, you know, by accident, uh, you know, so support each other. So, um, you're feeling you don't really need conspiracy theories or conspiracy because it's the elites who will be always protecting their interests. Is that, is that yeah. what you said that? Yeah. yeah and, and they don't, they don't need to, you know, there's no need for them to, to coordinate and, um, you know, conspire because, you know, even, even their independent, actions are uh, mutually reinforcing and you know as a byproduct of of maintaining the system they uh oppress and ex exploit uh working people so they um as a part of that um protecting their interests they of course have to um exploit people i'm not sure if that's quite what you said but uh -huh. Yeah, and uh, you know, um, you know. So when you sort of when you com combine that with, you know, the the you know middle class need to preserve their privilege, uh, you know, um, you know the uh, the system is. Uh, is 
self uh, perpetuating and uh, you know can operate uh, without concern for nature or uh, the well-being of the vast majority of humanity. So yeah, I've got this cat that's getting a bit um, a bit restless here. So I've, I'm finding it hard to concentrate. But um, you feel that um, the the middle class, the elites, um, they don't need to consider nature when they're looking after their interests. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, the privileges that, that the middle class and, and the, the elites enjoy are contingent on uh, the uh, perpetuation of the system that's uh, destroying nature and, and much of humanity. Uh, but, Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Could you say that again, please? Sorry, I, my cat was just going bananas. <laughs> okay. well, I wish I could uh, stroke your cat. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, the the privileges that uh, the elite and the middle class enjoy uh, are effectively derived from the destruction of. Uh, nature and uh, much of humanity. Uh, so um, as long as people value those uh, privileges, uh, there will be uh, ongoing destruction of the nature and humanity. Yes, yeah, so we've more or less come around to the similar thing you were saying um, that um, the, the privileges that the elites and the middle class are, are careful to protect is, is just involving the destruction of nature and and life and people. Uh, yeah, thanks. I feel heard. Well, I'm. I have, don't really have anything to say, but I'd be quite happy to pass it on to Richard if he would like another share because you came in late. So if you would like to yes. sure what i what i hear from you is that you um at the moment you have nothing to say and you would like to pass on uh to me sure yeah um yeah i like this this clarity that i oh richard who are you picking to be your listener. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, <laughs> Dan, Dan okay. would you like to? Yes, I would like to be your listener. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I like the somehow the clarity that I that I that I see now. Like, okay, yeah, it's about you know every storytelling is about core values that you somehow beneath beneath all the stories that are there, there is this little seed, and every story is just kind of almost like a container of this little seat where you just throw over and if people get the story, you know, the seat will kind of somehow and might grow further. So that's kind of, I, I like this idea. It, I like the simplicity of that. It also intrigues me to think like, oh yeah, kind of, it's actually rather simple. So, okay, just start with a simple thing with all life is beautiful and turn that into a story. So I like the simplicity of that. Okay, so what what I what I'm hearing is that you're you're enjoying the you're you're appreciating the clar the clarification that's happening here, but also within yourself. That um, perhaps um, it's far simpler than you than you thought, and that you particularly like the idea that um, that stories are sort of the carriers of of seed or memes or and at their base a value and if that value or that principle I, i'm throwing in principle which is an express value if that is for example all life is beautiful 
which is a wonderful thing, I guess, to, to imagine, then you can create a story around that. And as that passes, the story is that container for that, that core idea or principle that, or core value or principle that, that kind of propagates. Oh. It also kind of, when you um, use the word principle, it also reminds me, oh yeah, that's interesting. Like, you know, it's also from values <clears throat> to principles, kind of it's like building you know, some value that comes out in certain principles. And if you then make stories about those principles, kind of you basically um, share the principles and in that sense also spread, spread the value. Um, and there is some, there is in me some kind of, some hope, some deep belief, some, some, that that could be the immune system or so, in a way by constantly just, you know, finding enough people to spread that value. Um, To, to spread that value that that should be kind of that could be the immune system of humanity so to say that that this this um seeing our own value or seeing the value of humanity that is the immune system of humanity kind of mm, mm, mm. and i have 40 seconds uh, 30 yeah. seconds to reflect back at you um no I, I i love how this is beautifully coming together i, I feel that a lot of our ideas are or have been kind of embedded into this that that the way to 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 deal with the toxic system with the uh, middle class privilege the the elite uh, oppression um that the immune system for all of humanity in 12 seconds is uh, the telling of stories that embedded principles and values and memes and that we said the sent these out with the core idea that all life is beautiful <laughs> Yeah, you, you can just leave it, and then it automatically just brings you back uh, yeah. once the timer goes down. That's right. Hello, everyone, again in the main session. Let's wait for all us to join us. Edwin, is everyone is back? Uh, let me check. It's hard to. It should be within a couple. There's a breakout. They're still popping in, yeah. Okay, let's wait for those who are coming back to us. Okay. I think that's it. Yeah, okay, thank you. So we are all uh, back in the main session. And I suppose not everyone can stay with us for the last part of our call and well feel comfortable if you need to leave uh, but we will be happy to hear from all of you a report from discussion in breakout rooms and uh, i would like to ask bill actually to 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 pick everyone that, so we may do uh, the possibly efficient way uh bill would you help me uh, i'd be happy to so please uh, uh start with your name location location and xr groups uh, you are part of and then let's share our learnings our insights whatever we come uh, uh, with uh, from our breakout rooms. Great, thank you, Carolina. Okay, I'll just go around my screen um, and things change. So if I miss somebody, you know, let me know. Uh, so first on my screen right now is Jamie. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, yeah, that was really interesting. Thank you to everyone uh, in my group. I uh, yeah, for your honesty and like you, you, there's a lot of different kind of aspects kind of discussed. Um, yeah, I suppose my kind of like main takeaway is kind of like this this idea that like we have to like continuously challenge ourselves rather than like kind of just like find a way that is challenging to many people and make it our new comfort zone. Um, yeah, that's. Thanks a lot, Jamie. Ben. 
Um, yeah, I really appreciated that a few of us in the group expressed discomfort about recording and then we decided not to record and for me it felt like we went much deeper or certainly I felt able to uh, be myself more and um, it was uh, very interesting to hear other people's um, what other people had to say. Thank you Ben. Uh, AC. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed our, our breakout. There were a lot of uh, really great inputs. Um, I think it, what, what really stood out to me was uh, challenging this idea of individuality uh, within, within our cultures um, and trying to challenge it by way of collective uh, unity, um, like uh, team honesty uh, and, and collaboration. So thank you. Thank you, AC. Uh, Lou. Um, let's see, I'm, I'm grateful to have met new people. Uh, and I was very moved by uh, one, one of our people, Stephen, was in Uganda, had a very weak connection. And the group worked really hard to keep him included anyway. Uh, he posted things in the chat. We read them and reflected them. So there was a lot of creativity uh, and a lot of commitment to keeping everyone uh, connected and involved. And that was very beautiful to me. And I would say content-wise, the main thing that came out was the idea that, yes, we want to challenge ourselves and challenge parts of the system that aren't working. And, um, but that doing it with blame and shame, uh, that it's better to do it with love than with blame and shame. Thanks, Lou. April? Mm. Oh, thank you. Yes, Rich, as always. Uh, my takeaways were, you know, an, a deep well of gratitude for silence thinking time and also for you know this intangible quality that we call empathy and my final thought was about empathy with the other than humans you know that what that is and often we'll talk about that as awe awe inspiring and joyful and serene and uh, what if they feel that too what if they feel empathy when we beauty offer back that was my parting thoughts thank you oh thank you april uh, andrea yeah i would like to second I, we i was in the group that did not do the recording in the end and um it's it's worth thinking about it in some way we did go deep people i think felt unencumbered in a way and um what i um it, I think we took the topic to the inside a lot. Like, what is that inside a challenge for all of us? Um, and I was very grateful for, like, we, we named female and male, masculine and feminine energies. And I think it's a crucial thing. And I was glad that we got to talk about that and also to to come to that understanding of, you know, we, we all have that and we can support each other and, and come to a certain solidarity. And it seems crucial to where the movement is at, at this moment also to me. So that's, that was my takeaway. Thank you. Thank you. Carolina? Um, from for me, uh, it was challenging because one of our participants didn't feel good in a circle and, and drop out. So it was a difficult moment for all of us in a circle. Um, but referring to discussion, for me were two elements very important. I think that we kind of acknowledge that 
we are in a challenging moment of, for the movement. We didn't say that literally, but it was somewhere in the air of our discussion. We talk about love in action. We talk about Quaker, uh, Quaker quality in XR movement, which is very, uh, which is great for me uh, uh, because this is a, a huge element part of nonviolence action, nonviolent action. So yeah, that was probably the most important for me, love and action and challenging uh, culture uh, we live in, the culture that is in us. We want to change what, we have to change us. Thank you, Carolyn. Oh, Lizzie? Um, I think um, along with the kind of male, male, female energy, the complementary nature of those, um, the, there was a theme of vulnerability in our group. Um, and for me, it was how, you know, vulnerability is in one sense our, our strength, um, both individually and as a group. And for me, you know, meeting that vulnerability for myself is where I go outside my comfort zone. So that's something to work on. Thank you. Thank you, Lizzie. Uh, Katie? Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, it was, it was interesting. And um, I don't know if it's me or whether I, I feel slightly fragmented at the end today, which I don't usually feel. But I feel that was a lot, um, there was a lot of interesting things that were spoken about, particularly um, the idea of what love is. And I think that would be a good theme at some point because the way people perceive it may not be the same. And I've, it kind of left me with that, thinking about that. Um, but no, it was very interesting and it was nice that I agree with Lou that um, we tried really hard to, to pull everybody in and make it inclusive. And that was good. That was great. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Marguerite? Yes, it got um, got very convoluted, um, some of our discussions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and um, I felt um, I'm a bit more relaxed now. I've done it a few times, and um, so I'm not putting so much pressure on myself to, to hear everything. But it was good, and it was good when we had a fourth person, Richard, join us, made it um, move better. Thank you. Thank you, Marguerite. Ian? Uh, I think we enjoyed it. We went off piece a little bit and were a little bit naughty with maybe not just discussing the principle and values that are at hand, but also the nature of love and language and linguistics and truth um, and various other things. So it was quite rewarding and enlightening. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Dean. I consider myself quite privileged to have been in such a warm group. Um, I came across some activists that were really committed and we all discussed how we should push ourselves inwards to confront change because we've got to change ourselves in order to change others. And I was moved to tears at one point by uh, the passion that was involved in the group and I consider it a privilege to have been there and I'd like to thank everyone that was in my group. Well thank you Dean. Maureen? You're uh, muted Maureen. There you go. Yes, um, it was very uh, I think a very friendly group listening was powerful in that group today i felt 
And I suppose what I take away from the group is that uh, we are, you know, extinction rebellion. We are meant in many ways to be confrontational, which we are at times. But a concern, you suppose, that this confrontation or encounter with the other is coming from a deeper place within ourselves. So again, it has been expressed in this group to other groups also, the need to go inward in order to come outwards. And then another thing I think, somebody in our group mentioned either flowers turning, a spirit coming through flowers or something like that. I don't know if I got the poetry of it exactly right. But it strikes me that uh, our relation, that there is that need for, and I find this in myself, that needs for our relationship with nature, that we uh, become alive with nature. We suffer when nature suffers, creation around us. So it is that we share in so many ways the same spirit, that we share life, life at every level. And we are all interconnected. And um, appreciate this, uh, these uh, encounters every week. Although I missed the last two, I was busy. Sorry about that. But um, yeah, hopefully we can continue. It was, it was good. Thank you. Great to have you, Maureen. And uh, yeah, that's quite a remarkable. I just feel really privileged to uh, sit with the other three people in my group and hear hear the discussions about the toxicity of the system and the systems within the system and about everybody all of us how how much we are challenging ourselves to step up and step out and make change um it was an honor and it was deeply moving and a privilege so thank you everybody thank you Anne. richard yeah, I came a little bit late. I mixed up time zones and summer times and stuff. And I was happy that the group kind of smoothly integrated me. So I felt like, oh, yeah, I kind of nicely um, was accepted and integrated. Content wise, um, what's still with me is this kind of going from toxicity, kind of what is toxic, to what is immune system. And also, kind of what we explored is like, what is toxic to humanity and what is kind of what could be the immunity system of humanity. And one thing that we came to to the end that kind of really struck me is kind of that seeing the inherent value of human beings and the beauty of human beings, that is the, that is the immunity system of humanity. So that's, I found that a really powerful sentence where I still am mm. letting sink in. So yeah, I feel joyful. Great, thank you so much, Richard. Um, John, John Beto. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I was uh, very uh, excited that uh, we got from uh, challenging uh, the toxic system to the idea that uh, uh, we can bring uh, a new uh, story uh, using uh, established philosophies to uh, give people uh, a, a narrative for uh, how things uh, should be and uh, that uh, we have a, an, an all there is a way to create uh, a system that's uh, uh, devoid of, of the toxicity that uh, is destroying the planet and humanity. Thank you, John. Uh, Katya? Yeah, I feel privileged to um, have been in the breakout room with such amazing activists um, and I guess the most um, 
important thing I learned was that change starts within every single one of us. Um, and that the change within every single one of us is important to change the toxic system and that the toxic system is really a system within a system within a system and it's it's confusing but everything has a center of gravity and if you take not the center of gravity you've got it center of everything is money but everybody was really awesome and finding out about um how to change um myself and how to um the hypocrisy of the system and how to how to just listen you know it, it's amazing great thank you katya stefan well thank you bill and thank you for putting this song thing on it's a absolutely amazing opportunity i, I found and I was with an amazing group, four of us, and we had four rounds each. And I, I, I thought after each round, we got to know each other more and more. We'd be more open, we're more listening harder. And I, I think it just taught me how what a wonderful way to communicate with people. And much more of it, please. Yes, much more. And it, one, one last thing is um, everyone in the group, I, I just suddenly realised how magic they are they were and i really i really saw that and felt that so thank you to all of my group and thank you bill sure thank you stefan michael you're muted michael you, yeah there you go sorry yeah. okay yeah hi folks um yeah i was in a great group met some lovely people um and some really good insights were given um, you know, we have to remember, um, you know, XR is a climate and ecological organization um, uh, and we should actively engage whenever we can to challenge ourselves. We all do that, we all do that on different levels and of course to challenge, more so I would say to challenge the system because of ideological controls on our consciousness and our ways of thinking about the world, we de definitely need to challenge that. Also, we have to recognize also XR's demands and principles and adhere to them. The demands tell the truth. So media governments tell the truth. Act now. Media governments act now. Um, um, the third demand, form assemblies. So all those are things we have to actively engage in. Um, and for me, what's important is future planning for radical action. Um, we can plan out during the COVID-19 um, um, period of reflection and insight and having workshops like this. So planning for radical action in the future. Time is ticking. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Dan. Um, well, it was, it was quite a, quite a, I was in the group with Richard and John and, um, and Marguerite. Um, it was an amazing session of co-creation. For me, it kind of started with the idea of where is the essence of the toxicity in the system? And for me, it was, it's in, it's in our separation from nature. It's, a, it's, the, it's the inability of the system to value the intrinsic, um, the intrinsic value of, of, of human life, of all life, of all life. And that because we don't have a system that does that, we have an amoral, unethical system. And so we have our technological innovation is disconnected from orga organic realities and our ideologies, our economic ideology, our religious ideologies, these are many of our religious ideologies are also disconnected um, from the organic realities of, of living in the world. And then from there, it went from viewing the corporation as the manifestation, as a, man as a beast, in which we have to conquer this beast in some kind of a mythological sense. And then the idea that Richard kind of shared was this idea that, um, uh, that, that, the, that stories um, that which control, contain this value that all life is beautiful or this principle that all life is beautiful 
can be our immunity against this toxicity. And that by, and that in, that in essence, and this is something that there's some conflict here in some of these groups, I don't think it's so much about changing ourselves because I think there's something inherently unethical about that. It's about stories have more agency than individuals. It's about changing the story. And it's about propagating a story where at the essence of it, all life is beautiful. Thanks, Dan. Marta. Um, there's beautiful share, a lot of different voices that are contributing, they have contributed their own, each their own flavor. Um, the link to the indigenous knowledge and the elderly uh, and the elders um, remembering something we've got forgot that, that we have forgotten i suppose in, in ourselves in our bodies and part of the work is just uh listening just listening back to to ourselves and each other thank you thank you edwin uh yeah, so our, our group went in a lot of different directions, but uh, for me, you know, I always translate it into empathy. So I saw that the, uh, the toxicity was a lack of uh, mutual empathy, mutual listening, and a lack of uh, connection, which is sort of coming from our low sensitivity to our own and others felt experience, and a low sensitivity to how our actions might be in, in impacting each other and uh, nature and some real grief, uh, I think, at that lack of connection and, you know, uh, came up uh, in the group. And uh, also seeing this uh, cafe is sort of a detox cafe. So welcome to the, the uh, detox cafe here. Thanks, Edwin. And Stephen, and I hear that you may have some connection problems. But um, let's try, Stephen, right, can so you speak? You can speak or you can type into the chat and, and we'll reflect you. So I see that you're still muted, Stephen. Can you unmute? Good. All right, why don't you try speaking and we'll see if we can hear you. Uh, actually, it's, each, each day is a, a day of learning. Yeah, learning and learning. So um, it's been very great. Uh, 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 on my side, and I, I, I really appreciate the team I, 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 I've met with. Yes, my network is always a, a help me. Now, yeah, uh, but uh, uh, they have been so patient, so patient to me, and truly, I've learned a lot out of the, 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 the giants. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephen. Okay. Um, well, I just wanted to say uh, I was really uh, touched by my group, uh, the depth, and we talked about vulnerability being a strength. And I would just say that, um, and, I, and I really see that. I, mean, I saw it as a worker as, as a special education teacher. And so I think that every time someone's vulnerable, there should be some sort of uh, fan, some fanatic like me going, yeah, let's go. And uh, it should be recognized. So that's what I want to say. So every time you're vulnerable, there's some kind of idiot like me um, who's going there and really appreciates all the inner work you're doing. I think that's the uh, epitome of courage. Thank you. Carolina? Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everyone. Edwin, I would like to uh, uh, invite you to the final comments uh, of our meeting. Would you oh, like to? Yeah, say? it was uh, just about sort of next steps. Um, yeah, we have uh, sort of next steps. We have uh, again next week. We'll be having this empathy cafe. Uh, the next uh, 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 next principle. Uh, if you're wanting to, uh, we hope that you'll continue with, with the practice and also uh, start holding your own empathy circles. We, uh, if you go to empathycircle.com, there's a, 
all the information about the empathy circles. You know, you, once you do a couple of these, you get familiar with it. You, you're able to facilitate your own as uh, just to get started. And then there's some facilitation trainings that we do. We have a facilitator support group that meets on Fridays. And Friday, there's another uh, empathy cafe. So we hope that you'll uh, continue uh, on with that. And uh, let's see. Oh, the Friday COVID it, we, so mutual support group is on Friday. And then after that, we have a facilitator support group. You can come and uh, get support for facilitating empathy circles. And mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm forgetting something. Uh, I just put in a chat uh, links to uh, to our Empathy Circle working group where you can find all our events uh, Edwin just mentioned. Uh, there is also a link to, um, to all the principles of XR movement, uh, rebellion.earth. Uh, on this website, so we can look at the, those principles. Today was principle four, and next Saturday will be principle five. Um, so uh, if you want to look at those links, please copy those links, because when the meeting will end, you will lose this chat. So you need to copy those links to, to be able to, to see them later. Yeah, and is there anything else you would like to add, Edwin? Uh, thanks for facilitating, Carolina. We appreciate uh, that. Yes, thanks every facilitator as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you also those who experience difficulty uh, and stay with us uh, and try to be together and learn together. Thank you, everyone. And I would like to ask facilitators to stay for a while after the meeting so we can debrief. So thank you, everyone, and goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. We can do bio break if you want, guys. Do it. Fine. Do it. Just like yeah, need to. Okay. Mm. Uh, we can stop recording. <coughs> oh, I thought I did. Did I? Still record. Recording. Somebody else is recording. Really?